Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of Zeiss Conversations. Today, we are talking photography and fine art, and have we got a guest for you. Uh, the, the, our guest today is from Minneapolis. She is doing a bit of uh, um, photography, but also um, fine art and painting, and, and is going to talk about how she creates within the frame and, and how to bring those things together, and really... The, the, the conversation that always excites me, how to put these things to, to uh, you know, to, to, to into your passions, into your art. So without further ado, let's introduce our guest today in the center square is Julianne Yonker, not to be confused with the city of Yonkers, but uh, Julianne Yonker is from <laughs> Minneapolis, uh, a, a great city in its own right. I'm so sorry that the, uh, that the uh, Minnesota State Fair didn't happen this year. We went last year. That was terrific. Ooh. They still have the art show. Oh, do they really? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, that would be great to go. We had a terrific time. Sorry about that diatribe there. On the left is Kenneth Hines back from his uh, trip around the country doing some fantastic uh, landscape photography. And on the right, uh, Ambassador Tracy Page, as always, coming in from the great state of Georgia. Um, welcome to everybody. Glad to have you all here today. Hey, thanks for coming in with us, Julianne. We're very excited. Thank you for having me. So, Julianne, um, if you could do us a favor and, and kind of tell us how you got to uh, um, to the, being the artist where you were, how you started out, how you decided what to do, and, uh, and how you found yourself in Minneapolis. <laughs> I grew up here. Awesome. And I have been a painter since I was really little. Like, one of the first pieces of art that I remember doing was a portrait from life of my grandmother. Oh, wow. I remember drawing every wrinkle. And I just loved that experience of taking what I thought was the soul of a person and putting it to paper. And I was probably 10. I still have that portrait now. It's pretty funny to look at it now. But the art started way back then. Photography, when I grew up, back in the olden days, <laughs> it was all film. And we, would, we had little Polaroid cameras usually. And I was the one in the family who loved photography, but I was not the kid who took photography class and worked on the school newspaper, not techie. I only did like instant, and it was usually because I wanted to paint something. Uh -huh. So it was really as a reference photo. But when I look back at it, um, it was, I was a hippie at the time, and the collage on my wall was all photography. It wasn't a collage of paintings, whether that was because I didn't have access because we had National Geographic and it was cool photography. I don't know. Hmm. But I have always had that connection to photography as well. That's so, terrific. That's, that's funny because I I'm just relating to that because I do. I did the same thing. All of my photography started as reference for my paintings. And that's so yeah. very common, you know, even even now with my paintings. So one thing I was reading your bio earlier, and one thing that fascinated me is that you are an award-winning photographer, you an encaustic and um, cold wax artist, and then a sculptor. How do you have a favorite medium out of out of all of those, or what is kind of your kind of cross combination between all of those those aspects of art? Well, because that's you know that's when you talk marketing. Mm -hmm. People will always say, pick one thing, but that's not in my nature. Just like with photography, I did families, I did children, I did some weddings, um, but I guess I kind of ended up in fine art photography type of portraits. In, in the art world, the wax came about through sculpture because there's a method called the lost wax method. So you create the sculpture in wax if the end result is going to be bronze. And I could oh, okay. explain a whole book about the process. It's kind of too long to go into, but it involves a mold and then the pouring and the, and so I sculpted with wax. And that was when I first fell in love with wax. And then encaustic, which Tracy's probably familiar, at least hearing about it through photography. Oh yeah, no, I've, I've, I've done a bit of it. So that's usually with photography, you have your photo and you're using clear beeswax. But in caustic painting, you're actually using chunks of different colors and your palette is a big electric skillet. I could even grab my electric skillet, it's kind of cool. Again, it has all these dried flesh colors on it. And that's your palette for painting with encaustic. 
So I first fell in love with wax through the sculpture, then encaustic, and then there's another medium and it's called cold wax, completely different than encaustic. And it's kind of a fad right now. Cold wax is like this big thing in the art world. All it is is a medium. So no, I've just started. Ex I've just started exploring with it. It's interesting. It's just a medium like linseed oil. It's just something right. you mix with your paint. And if you use cold wax instead of linseed oil or walnut oil, it gives it a different consistency and it gives it a different sheen. So you can right build it. texture right away, which is what I love about encaustic. So it, to it say a changes favorite, that viscosity. Yes. So I combine encaustic and cold wax. I and, didn't know that you could combine encaustic uh, and cold wax. You have to be careful because the because of safety. With encaustic, uh -huh. heat it with actual fire, either a mm -hmm. heat gun or a torch, and you have to go across each layer to get it to adhere to the layer underneath. Cold wax, you're not supposed to heat because it has solvent in it. So if you do both, you have to do all of your encaustic first, put away all the encaustic stuff, put away that torch, and then you can do oil sticks or pastels or cold wax and oils. And okay, so I, I, I thought that the, I'm sorry, I'm asking a technical question. I probably shouldn't do this so, so oh. quickly, but I, I thought that the, um, the solvent was supposed to, to dissolve, to air off, uh, gas sure. off. So can you wait for the <clears throat> solvent to gas off and then heat it? Some people would say that, but since I teach, I have to be real safety, safety, safety. So I'm like, okay, we're done with encaustic. We're putting it all away. Now do a little cold wax. Cause I, I actually don't... do it all on my porch so that I'm out in the open air. Okay. Well, I don't find any reason to go back and forth. Okay. Like I put the cold wax on. I don't want to go back to encaustic because to me, encaustic is building up all those layers and the cold wax is just this little bit of frosting on top. Okay. All so right. I, I haven't really, tried to mix them yet. I just, I'm just starting with the cold wax. It was another one of my little, I'm going to try this things, even though nobody was doing it at the time. And you couldn't even post online if it was a cold wax site, you couldn't put something that had encaustic. And if it was an encaustic site, you could. So it was like the two different denominations. But now things have kind of gotten over that. Well, so, I've always been awful too about, you know, painting and gesso and then adding oil paint or, yeah. I mean, I'm just, and, 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 you know, or painting with the wrong kind of oil paint and then trying to hit it with a blowtorch. So right. I, I decided to stand outside and I put a table out on the porch so that I could work out there so that I wouldn't kill myself. The light is That's great. probably what's happened to my brain cells. <laughs> I think actually what's happened to my brain cells of all those years of sucking my brush to a point when it had cadmium yeah. red. That too. There's, <laughs> yeah, a that's... Of, there's a lot of health danger things in, in all art or pigments, oh, pastels, I, you're using them in. Talk about wearing a mask. You should I'm convinced. Mask on for if, I, if I ever get cancer, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm convinced it's all the pigments I've sucked over the years. And we're just oh. horrible about that. So tell me a little bit or tell us about how you're incorporating the photography into the different mediums right now. Well, for instance, I think one of the images that you might have used in the promo thing, it's a, the guy with the teal drape. It's Dionysus. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah, it's up on the screen. You can see that one. Um, I started, I have a thing at my studio called The Nest where artists come and stay and paint with me and study with me. I also am an Airbnb because I have these rooms. So it's the same, only I'm not teaching them. So Airbnb mm -hmm. is way easier because all they do is come and sleep <laughs> in, instead of painting in the art room and teaching, but I love both. So I started a little self-made project that was called Guests at the Nest. And I was photographing people that came to stay and as soon as this young man walked in the door, I was like, we are so having a photo shoot it's like, as soon as he walked in. And did you find that image? Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's up on yeah, the screen. Uh, that was like a 10 minute long photo shoot at the most. I didn't move a thing. That um, almost halo looking thing behind him mm -hmm. is, is a medallion that's actually on the wall. So I didn't even use a backdrop threw one of my drapes at him. He didn't have anything else on. And we just turned on the light and did a quick photo shoot. So I love having that pre-painting and then going through and picking out which was the best one. I was trained to paint from light. 
So the training that I have is where somebody sits on a chair. So in the room behind me right here, this very blurry to you guys portrait of my husband, he sat mm -hmm. for 50 hours. Wow. And then I worked 50 more hours from a photograph that I took with the Hasselblad. So it had some pretty good detail. And there is really a benefit in painting from life. And there are still a lot of artists that that's the only way they'll do it. For instance, if you look at your own arm and you see the colors of the veins and um, the, the different colors in your skin tone, and now your names are gone. So I, I can't see the name of the other person, the other host. Kenneth. Oh, Professor me, Hines. Kenneth. Kenneth. <laughs> Kenneth, it just says Professor Hines now. Um, <laughs> Kenneth, if you look at all the different tones in your skin that are so beautiful, if you take a picture and work from the photo, a lot of that is lost. Mm. So when I'm going to work from a photo, I really like to have a good quality one. So I use my good equipment whenever I can, if I know I'm going to be painting something. Because you really do lose, it's really weird, because wouldn't you think, and with the mirrorless, the detail, and the Hasselblad, when you blow it up, it's really not the same as painting from life. I, you know, I try to, to explain that to clients all the time that the, the photo that I take is not necessarily the person I see. And, yeah. and I, I think that that's what happens. There's something lost in, you know, the animation of someone that, that in a photo, we, we lose that a little bit. Well, there's that too, the animation of the, the person's personality, but I mean, even just the physical, the colors, because you wouldn't see, I can see purples and greens and blues on my skin. And you don't see that if I photographed my arm a little bit with really good stuff but so i was trained like that but who's going to sit for 50 hours and like no, that, and like you're right Dad, we had 10 minutes he was here to see minneapolis with his dad not not to and it wasn't a commission painting so the reality is nowadays you usually work from photos most artists but it's always wonderful to be in a, a group where you hire a model and you can still work from life so it's kind of I'm sorry, Kenneth, okay. go ahead. So it kind of puts me in the mindset of one of our of guests that we had from the Met Museum, Eileen Travell, yeah. uh, and her discussing with us what she does in the imaging department there. And being a fine artist as yourself, you know, and some of the things that she shared with us is about that fine detail and what they have to go through that's very meticulous. You yeah. Mean, I know it's so difficult. Of, of paintings good. and the sculptures and, and yes. how many frames they have to take for a specific piece, how perfect the lighting has to be. So yeah. I, I can only imagine uh, as far as, you know, looking at, a, an, at an image and you might see visually, you know, the detail that's there, but then you take a photo and you're trying to do the same thing. And it's like, no, right. I remember there is detail here and and just looking at the paintings that you have on your site, I would think this this looks like it's a photograph, but it's not. It, it's so detailed as far as everything that you, like that. that's what you're seeing. That's your naked eye seeing those details. Yeah. Now, Julianne, are you still using photos as the base of, of any of your encaustic projects? Oh, no, I, I teach that but I've never really loved it with my work. Like I've taught other people <clears throat> who do beautiful black and whites and they just look mm -hmm. amazing. I think encaustic, if you're doing encaustic with photography, it usually looks the best on medium to high key images because the wax is white. And if you put it on a low key image, it gets very foggy. And sometimes you want that ethereal foggy vibe but not usually, at least with mine. I've had some successful ones, but I did that for a while and I was immediately like, let me paint with the stuff. I don't like this. I don't, I don't want to be married to that photograph under there either. And the size, because a lot of my paintings, you can't tell there, but that Dionysus is 30 inches big. So No, I, I didn't realize it was that large. Yeah, and my favorite encaustic, Jimi Hendrix is 30 by 30. So you'd have to make a big, huge fiber. Yeah, it's, I don't love doing it, but there are amazing artists that make really cool stuff that it's very conducive to their work. 
and I've had students that come to do encaustic and then do the painting, but their photos are so cool. And the photo itself looks so cool with just encaustic that they barely, we end up not doing a lot of embellishment beyond that. So it's really individual to each artist what medium is going to work best. And so much photography is just beautiful on its own. And a lot well, of photographers yeah. don't acknowledge that. They always think the painting is better, like it's the higher art. And to me, it's a continuum. It's just, look at Steichen. How can anything be better than Steichen photography, you know? I, I think it's just, we, we just have to wrap our head around the fact that, that the camera is an acceptable brush. Yep. And, and I do, I see the work coming out of the nest, your, your studio. And I do see a lot of the student work that looks almost like straight photography or very, yeah. very lightly touched photography. But then I look at your work and to me, your work is obviously an oil painting and not, not a photograph anymore, but right. I wondered what your process was. Um, and I struggle with it. So I'm, I'm hearing what you say, cause I struggle. Um, I'm not liking putting things on top of my photos and when I do use my photo underneath for reference, I'm wanting to completely cover it up so that you can't even tell it's there anymore. I would probably like freehand painting. So many photographers think they can't paint because they're scared or whatever. When they hear my program about art, they'll go, I remember back when I used to paint. But the truth of the matter is photographers know about composition. They know about lighting. They know about color balance. They know about storytelling. If, if you're involved in organizations like we have, you've, you've been mm -hmm. trained in all things art. So the, it's, it's a very little step to go from that to painting if you have the desire. No, you know, I, I, I'm I actually a classically trained painter. I just, you know, just finished raising children and, and put, yes. the, put the oil paints away because I had yeah. children in the house. Yep. And I think I'm ready to, to yes. pull them back out. So I'm wanting to come to one of your, I want to come see you at the nest. Oh, I'm going to come play with all of this. Ken, I love it. <laughs> Ken, I think a lot of what you were creating in the last, if, if anybody follows Ken, he's been around doing some, some, um, some long exposure and, and, and Julianne to what you were saying, it almost, it's, it's almost as important what you don't see, what your mind can compose um, rather than the crystal clarity of, of a super sharp image. I, I often do that is it, it, I'm always excited by the artist that, that, puts takes my eye somewhere that they want me to see you know and let me construct everything else you know the the images that are that are softer or not as clear and it yeah. it really gives you some of that composition and kind of brings you in you know uh, and kenneth i was thinking of some of the waterfalls that you did just recently you know there's there's a softness to the water movement um that that, that gives it a real feel that lets me as the viewer construct what i'm seeing that's, I mean, I brought up Steichen. Mm -hmm. That was the whole thing about him. They don't even really, you can't tell really if it's a charcoal drawing or, you know, his, what was their process? Bichromic gum, bichromic, where they would manipulate it in the dark room. Oh, yeah. And so it looks like a charcoal drawing. And I kind of almost felt guilty that I was not in love with Ansel Adams type of F64 stuff because it yeah. just, doesn't appeal to me personally for everything to be in focus like that. And, you know, that's why I was drawn to what I do with the real abstract backgrounds. Even if the person is in focus, you'll see a lot of abstract stuff happening. And I haven't seen your work, Kenneth, but I, I'm sure it probably has that same feeling. Well, there's something and, you mentioned at the, the top of the program that really resonated with me and something that, uh, I think of all of the guests that we've had, you're, you've been the first one where we really share a similarity, and that is being multidisciplined. How important is, is being multidisciplined for you and what you do? Because it's, it's very rare that we have any artists that, you know, do a multi kind of genre, weddings, portraits, whatever it may be. How important has that been for the work that you do? I think it's been really important because everything informs the next. Like everything I learned in photography informs my painting. Everything I learned in the classical training of painting informs my photography. And even within each medium, drawing is the base of all painting. 
So I still love to do charcoal drawings, but that to me is the basis of a good painting. So it's all, it's all the same for me. And that's why I haven't just said, when, if you go to my Instagram, you don't see one thing. You know, I go to Instagrams and it's like, everything looks the same. I think, wow, that's what real branding is. Do I not have a brand? Cause I have a photo on there and then a sculpture and then this and that, but you have to follow your own artistic path. And for me, I still love doing all of it, but I go through stages. Like I haven't done encaustic painting for a while. I've been doing um, cold wax and oils. So I go through stages. One thing you and said I that's very sculpture. important is, is that you, you're you taking things from one medium and it applies to something else. And it's, it's just a continuation process. And it, it's ironic that I just had this discussion on uh, a live uh, over the weekend where um, I, I had several comments because I just shared the portrait and someone left a comment that said, I didn't know you did portraits. I said, I only ever use the word photographer. I don't classify myself as a specific genre photographer. Okay. And because art is art, just as you've said, everything has a connection. Right. So I enjoy landscapes. And if I photograph a wedding, most people just focus on the couple. But what about the ambiance around the couple, the location that they're at? All of that tells the story. Yeah, and your experience with doing landscape would make a huge difference in photographing a couple, for instance. When I sent you guys images, I had to think about that. Well, do I send a little bit of this and a little bit of that? And I was like, no, I'll do the branding thing and just send portraits. But if you go on my website, I have abstract landscapes that I love doing. I'm working on two of them right now. So yeah, I'm kind of got my hands. I, I see Tony in the background trying to pull up a, a landscape <laughs> for you. Yeah, I don't. Oh, I, I don't have anything set it. up. Um, a lot. Lake Superior. <laughs> but yeah, he's when I saw the graphic one. of what this, you know, I was thinking, oh, she's a portrait, a fine art, uh, photographer. Right. But yeah. then I went to your website, and I'm like, this lady does everything. I'm like, I just wouldn't like. That's why I was excited to I'm like someone that I can get to ask questions as far as the multidiscipline side of things of why is it that they do everything? Does that, that looks at Tony's got one of your landscapes up and it looks a little bit like a Turner to me. It's really pretty. It is. Is that the Lake Superior? Is it called Superior Shores? Uh, no, it's from, um, it's from your Instagram on May 20th. It so. looks like a Creek. Yeah. So it's interesting it though. But it's, it's got, it's almost got a William Turner kind of feel to it. It's really pretty and I've soft. It, it doesn't look like bigger than a creek. <laughs> oh. Weird. Is it framed? Mm, it's no. got uh, two trees on the right and, and, a, and a shock of green on the, on the left, like a teal hunter, like a teal green, almost know. like a peacock. Oh, but, you I know. sold that one. Hmm. Yeah, that is a little abstract landscape. That one has a funny story. It started as a demo in a workshop and I didn't like it. I, and I was trying to look at a photo that I had taken on a traveling trip. So I have, this is weird you guys, cause I'm just thinking about this now. <laughs> I don't like to work from an exact photo for landscapes because when you're doing a person's face, if I do Tracy, it has to be Tracy. But if I'm doing a tree, I can change whatever I want. And so I was working from a specific photo and I didn't like it. I can't tell you how many times I painted over this thing. Because with wax, that's fine. You can build up, build up, build up. So finally, my son was like, I love that one. So he took it. It was his birthday present. And I gave it, oh, to, him wow. and gave it to him in an antique frame. So two years later, I go to his house. He goes, here, you can have this back. But I'm keeping the frame. So yeah, the painting. Well, send like, send me the little painting and I'll I'll frame it. <laughs> well, I was like, yeah, no surprise because that wasn't my favorite. So no, I home, I love it. And I took paint and rolled right over that whole thing. Just a I, in fact, I let the grandbabies do it. I was like, Bella, here, take some paint. So we completely covered it up. And that night, I painted that painting on it oh, in wow. one night. Oh, out oh of my, my gosh! Without looking at a photo, and it's totally different than. The original thing I was trying to paint was like wheat with sun on it in the morning <laughs> and posted that and somebody bought it. So that's just one of those crazy stories of how, how it goes. 
<laughs> and sometimes inspiration hits you at the strangest times, the strangest yeah. ways. That's I have one up in the I have an oil paint up in the hallway that I did. That's wheat on a little house in the back. That just it's just a huge feel of wheat, and I just you know it's been there for twenty years. I love it. <laughs> Growing up, I was always, a, I, I guess this is why I love landscape photography, um, you know, focus on that uh, for Bob Ross. And yeah. uh, just recently, there's a new person that has kind of stepped in the role of continuing uh, oh, okay. this kind of broadcast. Um, Happy trees. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a painter by the name of Nick Hankins. And his he's, of what Bob Ross was known for, I feel like he takes all of that and then magnifies it by by three. Cool. And some of the paintings that he's done, I'm just like, how is this not a photograph? The the level of detail and, and just how how just descriptive of what he's doing is it's just beautiful work. And I, I love what you said as far as in painting a landscape, you can change whatever you want. It does not have to be exact. Because and every I day when I'm not trying to do that. Like there, there is one at Lake Superior that was done for the Make-A-Wish Foundation does this thing where you work with a child who has cancer and you do a painting together and they auction it off. So I had done this as a study so that I'd know where I was going before I was working with this child. So we did the thing, they auctioned it off, made a ton of money, great experience. And I had my study here. Every time I'd walk by it, I would think, oh, it's too literal. It's too like in my face. And so I did the same thing, which is one of the things I've learned from cold wax about just rolling like a paint roller, rolling right over your painting. It's so liberating. It's so fun. <laughs> so, it, but it's, it gives a different look. It's more of a semi-abstract look. And so I rolled over that painting and now I love that painting. And I, I couldn't stand walking past it. So I've really learned to nothing is precious. And you just, if you don't love something, I was doing portrait right here of my grandchild. I think I have two versions posted on my Instagram and decided that it wasn't perfect. So my sisters were here the other night and they were kind of horrified, but I took turpentine and scraped and rubbed the whole thing off. After the versions you'll see on Instagram and repainted it and now it looks exactly like her and now her mom said it's perfect so oh. nothing has to be done you can you go until you know in your heart as an artist that it's done and it's really fun to pull out old paintings that you started years ago and take them to a new place yes so, i i do that very often with photos i'll go back in time and pull a photo and remaster it and i'm nope of things that I've learned, of new techniques that I yes. might know as far as mastering in, you know, Lightroom or Photoshop yeah. and see, okay, what can I actually make? It's it sometimes I can visualize the final image, but I might not have the skills to do it right then and might have to come back, you know, yep. years later. Yes. So in, in doing, in, in kind of doing that, is there a project or something that you have that you may not have done in your career right now what you might want to do in the next five or ten years is there something that you have ambitions to do that you haven't done yet hmm. i think that i'm doing what i want to do because i really love doing commission portraits but i also love being able to do my own work on the side i guess it would be more sculpture because i i felt like doing sculpture was the most organic feeling medium to me ever. It just felt like it was natural for me, but it's so stinking expensive to make bronze. Like they cost 5,000 bucks for the artist to have the process done. So I've only done them when I have a commission, which is really dumb if I love it that much. So now as I'm getting into the stage of life where I'm gonna do more what you're saying, what, what do you wanna do? That's one of the things. It would be to do more sculptures. I actually have a friend right now who's working on a commission piece of John Lewis, and he's um, he's been sculpting it in wax, and it's about to be bronzed. Whoa! And it's just I saw the wax version of it, and it's just it's beautiful. Now I've not, I've, I mean, I no, I I'm pretty sure I haven't sculpted in wax. I've sculpted in clay, and I've sculpted in um, in plaster. Um, but I love the story of. 
I'm sorry? You're carving. That's what's so right. Different. Instead of adding on like you do with clay, you you glob this molten wax onto your what do they call it? Not a substrate. There's a word for the under I think that, that's made out of wire. And after you glomb it on there, you're using heat just like with encaustic and carving into it. Like I, I got on, you do that with plaster too. You start with a block and you carve it out. Okay. With what? And pottery? With plaster. Plaster. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. You 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 pour it into a block and then you carve from that. So I've I've done that. Is it hard? But I um I no, I didn't seem hard to me. I liked it better than clay. Because with clay you're constantly adding to it and molding it. With the plaster you start, you, you have to do it before it hardens too much. So it's kind um, of in between. Right. It's not really cured yet because once it cures, it's really hard to manipulate. That would be um, similar. My memory of it seems it's been a while for me. There's a uh, fantastic um, artist in Atlanta, Karina Sephora, who is a blacksmith and she is, um, her metal sculptures are really incredible. I'm just, I just love sculpture. I love getting my hands into things. I think it's fun that you're doing this. And I love the stories too about Degas and that his ch his children or child were the ones that actually converted his into bronze. He only did wax sculptures. He never bronzed them during his life. Right. right. They're really pretty with it, the wax that I used was really dark brown and I actually liked the way it looked better than when it was bronze because I'm not a shiny girl and and it's shiny when it's bronze and it has that beautiful matte which is why i love wax it's why i love encaustic and cold wax it, well, it obviously led you to working with encaustic and cold yep. wax exactly from, from one step to the other so what kind of photography are you doing these days are you doing are you still doing any i just had a little being here last night running around my backyard third child in a family and congratulations it was one of those so wonderful and fun because now that I'm doing less photo sessions I thoroughly enjoy each one and we knew exactly what we were doing because they're pretty much repeat clients now almost all and so I know what I'm matching I know it's already on their wall at home so I know exactly what I want and yeah I'm doing some of that but you know with COVID the whole universe has been shut down and all of my everything that I do art shows like all the art shows are canceled. I'm in six shows right now all across the country. They're all virtual. Yeah, I have I have two going on and um, one of them is going to do an in-person reception now in the spring, but it, it opens, I think, tomorrow. And the other one is um, going to do, they're going to do in-person and virtual. They're going to do both. They're going to do the artist talk virtually, but, but they're actually going to hang it in the gallery and open it up. So, and that opens the middle of the month, I think. It's so different to see art in person and paintings when it's just virtual. It's even way worse. Like we were talking about the lady who photographed at the Met. Well, can you imagine all of us artists just photographing our own? We don't work oh. for the Met and don't have all that equipment. You know, trying to get it to look like it actually looks is almost impossible. And I think I, it's worth with, worse with wax because it's subdued. And I think it's more difficult with low key. Like there was another artist I'm in this group and he was like, why do my paintings look so dark and boring on, on artsy where all of our paintings are? And I was like, I feel your pain. I think of that every time I see mine on a, on a, you know, virtual world. It's, it's kind of like where one thing that we always try to, to mentioned to people is that you really don't get a chance to really see your art in its full form unless you actually have it on print, you know, printing out our work. Right, and, right, for photography, totally. And Absolutely. it's like, you know, people don't really see the true quality, and I, I stress that a lot as far as you're not seeing the true quality of your imagery by looking at it on a display. I don't care how good the screen is. <laughs> and the fine art papers are so beautiful for photography. Just... Eileen, by the way, just uh, uh, she just chimed in and said armature was the word you were looking for. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Yes, Eileen is, is our friend from the Met. So she's she's uh -huh. watching us and paying attention. She's the one that you interviewed. I was so yes. 
it was so um, validating for me to hear that she's an introvert and she gets nervous before every session. I was like, yes. Because <laughs> even that little girl that I, last night, I'm pacing around before it, didn't want to have anybody in the house. I have to get in a mindset. It's like a whole thing. It's not like you just grab the camera and go. Never has been for me. And I've been doing it for 25 years. <laughs> no, I'm I'm the same way. I had um, I had a lot of clients in Atlanta this weekend and I, I drive myself nuts before each and every session because you know you want to give that client your best every time and especially repeat clients some of my clients have been with me for 15 years and it's just you know every time I want everything to be as good if not better than their last experience and it, it just we beat ourselves up trying to do it no and I want to capture you don't want to just take pictures like if it's a portrait I want to capture something very significant about that person and you don't know if you're going to get that i mean it always happens in the end but it's that feeling before that you you want to get it and you know when you got it and like last night we took three shots and i'm like we're done yeah, we're good <laughs> Not really, but we're we good. could because we got it <laughs> she was it? a perfect little angel and yeah that kind of how old was she good for you. she was one Wow, oh, wow, that's a hard age. And she was standing by the little vintage stroller and gave that serious, deep, you know, 90 years of wisdom that a one-year-old can have in their face. <laughs> and that's all I needed was that. That's scary. The thought of a question with that statement of you only taking three frames, how, how much time do you take in actually concentrating on the actual composition to make sure that you get the right photos to where, you know, we, we've had this discussion about taking hundreds of images. Right. Uh, but we've had um, our guest, uh, Mario, a couple weeks ago, uh, shared that, you know, he takes a lot of time to really focus on taking yes, that perfect image. Him. But he's taking a picture of a building, not a one-year-old. <laughs> so yes, yeah, a lot that. different there. <laughs> so um, I actually took over a hundred pictures. I was just jokingly saying oh, got okay. it. she was so perfect. But yeah, with a kid, you it's you're getting it and moving and let's bring this over and let's bring this doll in and can you say hi to the baby and it's all fast. And I've done for my career, it's been mostly portrait photography. When I'm working with a model, then it's different. When you're doing a fine art thing with a model, then you're like getting every little you know, tie this bow and fix that one curl over here and all that stuff. Yeah, when so. you're working with a child, you're just you're just trying to get that personality in a fleeting moment that that will give you something you can work with later on. Yep. <laughs> so for those that might be viewing this and, you know, might be in a situation to where they're unsure about what genre they might want to, to, to concentrate in or what fits them or they just might not have any kind of direction at all as far as what they want to do in art. What would you share to, to someone like that that might be undecided as far as uh, what they want to do or what kind of avenue they should take in, in art as a whole? I would tell them to dabble in a lot of them because when you do that thing that speaks to you, you know it. Like you've heard, you guys have heard all the stories about photographers and I went in the dark room and then I knew, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I was reborn in the dark room. And I think, and like me with my grandma, painting my grandma at age 10, I knew that I loved putting somebody's being on a piece of paper. So I would say to try different things. And now it's so easy to take classes because you don't even have to go anywhere. You know, you could try so many different mediums and stuff. And all you have to do is go on Instagram and keep a folder of everything that you love. And that tells you a lot about what you like. Not necessarily that you want to do it, but usually. You know, either yeah, I, I keep an idea folder, the same thing. I have an inspiration folder on every computer and there's like it's a ridiculous amount of images in them. But yeah, that that tells you and I've gone through my inspiration folder and made a favorites. And then I've looked at them and said, why do I love these? 
And weirdly enough, you guys, my inspiration folder is usually filled with things that are very unfinished looking. Like, like very kind of what they call now disrupted realism. And I didn't include any of my paintings like that, but that is a direction that I'm going. And there's, they're, they're on my website, but I didn't want to be confusing and have. <laughs> no, it's, it's, and, and disrupted realism is, it's an interesting concept. And it's one that I struggle with because I've always been so photorealistic in my painting that yeah. I have trouble letting go. I mean, cause you really do to be able to do that. You have to let go. Right. And, That's what and I, I can't, I can't. You'd be able to after what it is in the Maybe a few tequilas. When you're, <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Freehand painting. You have to get it right before you can get it wrong, so to speak. It's like the best impressionistic painters could make perfectly detailed, like Degas. Have you seen Degas' early drawings? Oh, yes. Perfection of his early drawings. Sargent, like all of the greats that look like they ch 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 no, no, that took no. years of practice, right? Years of knowing exactly well, where that stroke goes. Even it's Picasso, his early drawings are very yes. detailed. Yes. or paintings so yes that's all like getting that base so that you can go there like cartoonists amaze me where they can take reality and and warp it so much and it still looks just like the person that's magic to me because <laughs> i try no. to do a cartoon and it looks like the person <laughs> yeah well i and i don't i can't get that to look like the person because i can't I can't, I don't have any relationships. So I'm, my closest example of, of who I'm like is more like Chuck Close um, because he has the same disorder that I have. And so um, the way Chuck Close was able to do it was photograph them. And then he moved it into painting by grid work. Yep. And I, I almost do the same thing, but I learned that from, you know, my art classes in the eighties, I studied Chuck Close and that was the first time I was able to really relate to how to go from photograph to painting because I struggled with it. And they, that's been done since the beginning of time, gridding. There's there's every different way to, to get it from here to there. Yes, but he did it too so that he could remember the details of the face because he can't he can't remember the details of a face, which is exactly what I suffer from. I can't remember the details of a face, so. And you know how huge his paintings are. Oh yeah, the sides of buildings. I love them. And then, you know, I, the story is as, as he, a friend of mine, Tom Rouse, who's a photographic illustrator and well, you know, Tom, um, in Chicago. And Tom had said that his son lives in, in uh, or had lived in the same building with, um, with Chuck and um, just the way that he, as a paraplegic had to pull back and even make that more of a good work thing because he could no longer get in and do the fine detail anymore. I think it's, but again, the stories about like um, Monet painting and as he was losing his eyesight and it became more about the, the painting of the light, the shadows and the light. I think, yep. I think that, you know, age really does change how we perceive what we're, what we're working on. If you look at most, if you look at art history, so many artists go from the realism and more and more into abstract and sometimes to completely abstract by the end where it's just blocks of color I also do abstract work, but that's what I do the least of, you know, when we were talking about doing different things. I've, some of my favorite artists are abstract artists and I have their paintings in my house and love them. I, I, I love them. I just have a hard time getting there myself. Well, I usually end up putting a figure in it. <laughs> I can do an abstract painting. In fact, that's how some of my series started, the Transcendence series. They started as abstract paintings. And they could have been finished abstracts, but I saw a person on them after living with them. And so then like a year later, I was like, I know what I should paint on that. And then I would paint that the portrait on it. That's that one that you have up was one of the first ones. I, and I love that. And there's no, there's, there's no photograph in that, right? That's a, the painting. No, there was a, no, not in it. No, no, nothing on my website has the photo stuff. I actually made a separate website so people wouldn't get confused because I did both and mixed them. And I've always loved painting. So the whole time I was a photographer, hand coloring black and whites back in the day. And then chiaroscuro, where I made this method where you'd put paint and then um, subtract the paint. You know, I always tried to combine. And then when digital happened, it was painter working with Corel painter and painting the images. Right. So 
when people saw those paintings, they thought they were my photos. And I was like, oh, I need a separate website. So people know these are all freehand paintings. Photography is over on the other website. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking of closing that website and just having a folder of photographs. You can tell well, me. Well, if you're not selling you it anymore, that. then yeah, you don't, if that's yeah. not what you're doing, then I, right. I'm a big believer in showing what you want to do, putting out there in the universe what you want to do and, you know, subtracting a little bit from all the clutter. That's what I'm, and, and paying for the second website for what? My clients, yes. and they already know me. So I think I'll make a whole yes. that says photography and that will be. You know, it's I'm funny because ninety-five percent of my work is is headshots, and if you look at my website, I've taken so much of my headshot work off of my website. Yeah. But they know me as that. I don't have to market that, and I want to market. I love. I'm loving doing black and white, high contrast black and white, and editorial. And so I'm trying to to market more of that, and um, just you know, rid myself of not of my bread and butter work but of showing it because it's just yeah. not what I want to put out yeah. yep. so I Kenneth. think that's the same concept yep Kenneth where were you going with that yep I'm I'm the same way also you know I trying to I always want my community to be to be engaged with everything that I do uh, kind of my popularity built uh, thanks because of Tony and Jason Vong for the street interview last year so even though that's the newest genre that I do, that's what people got introduced to first. And so everything else is kind of a surprise, but that's why when people go to my website, you don't see a street image that pops up when you open my website. It's, it's a fashion image or it's a wedding photo because I want people to recognize that as well. You know, I don't have to market the street, like you said, you know, that's, that's something people know me for. And that's a great thing about PPA, don't you think, Tracy? The the, the varied thing, you know. Yeah, like I'm, I'm wishing. Us, wishing it was to... a little bit more varied. <laughs> but I mean, that, that nobody told us we had to do one thing. Oh, this is true. This is very true. Well, and the other thing that I love about PPA is just the, um, you know, because I wasn't a photographer when I when back in 2006, 2007, when I first started. Um, in headshots. I was not a photographer. I was a painter. So PPA, I knew, and I know your experience is going to be similar. We see the light. We know where to paint the light, but now we have to be able to purposely place the light and photograph the light. And right. PPA taught me how to do that. So it's, I, you know, I'm always going to be thankful, but I am learning now that there's this whole world. I am, I just joined, um, well, not just joined, but I just re-upped my APA membership and um, MSAP and or AM. SP. I'm going to get all my letters mixed up. <laughs> and um, I, I'm trying to, I just joined Atlanta Celebrates Photography. I just joined APG Atlanta Photography Group. It's like I am all of a sudden realizing that beyond the studio portrait, there are all these genres of photography out there that I haven't explored yet. So it's now that it's taken me at this point in my life for me to understand that a camera is a paintbrush because I didn't believe that for so long. So now that I understand that my camera is my paintbrush, all of a sudden there are all of, there's this whole world out there that I'm I'm learning to explore beyond PPA, but PPA is my foundation and and they've been fantastic. Yeah, photography is so different than than what we've done for a living. And you know, those words are used a lot on portrait even my website and it really isn't what fine art photography is in our world fine art photography can, i don't know if you can see this i just got um I, i'm going to move it up i just got a a piece up for the it's the one right here um i can see it this is oh, this is going to um this is going to show um it's it's actually going on monday um so this is this is a headshot client that I've been shooting for four or five years. She's the star of a movie. She's the star of a TV show, but that has nothing to do with that. It just was a pure, this is joy of getting in and photographing her and playing and being completely out of the genre for both of us. And um, just loving that ability to kind of get in and do that. But mm -hmm. I really want to reintroduce oil and clay and pastel and sketch and wax into everything so um you know 
here, COVID has been tough because my husband's been working right behind me. So he all of a sudden has a home office in, in our, right. in what had been my play space. And I no longer have a play space. Pastel is another fun thing to mix with photography. I should try that. Well, I, I need to see a little bit more of what you're doing there and kind of understand how you're mixing them. I'll, I'll, we can um, email, I can show you some examples of that because that's God. very fun and quick. I, I know there's a nude that's that on my website in the, I don't know what folder it's in though. I had a, a nude hanging in, a, in, a, in an Atlanta uh, corporate office for years. And it was actually, it was real memorable because that was the nude that I was working on when I actually learned that I was face blind. Um, God, we have, this conversation has gone so quickly. All of a sudden we're, we're at an hour and it has just flown by and this has just been so much fun for me. And uh, Julianne uh, Yonker, and she has a studio she calls The Nest, where she invites artists to come study with her. And I am definitely intent on doing that. Is there anything you wanna, you wanna talk about in that process? No, you could contact me directly. You don't have to do all the whole thing. It's all there online, but feel free to call with questions. I love talking and to people in real life on a phone. <laughs> And she also has a B&B &B there, an Airbnb at her nest, and she may draft you for portraits. So be aware of that. It's true. Um, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen when you're hanging with Julianne. Right. That sounds it. Always make sure that you, you, you come prepared to be photographed. I think that's, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially if you're looking for a place to stay, to have that's, all that art surround you and then be invited into it is just you offer a really terrific uh, opportunity there for sure. Um, Absolutely. And well, I think we learned that you don't have to prepare to be photographed because she will drape you if you're not. Yes, of course. <laughs> Hold up and throw a piece of fabric at you. Hey, good to go. Well, Julianne, thank you so much for being part of our conversation today. Um, we certainly appreciate it. And I, 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 knowing that there's ways to branch out not only within uh, photography to, gen uh, to other genres, but also to take that and expand it into uh, craft or artistry, you know, in, in the direction that you want, as the artist want to go. Certainly that's a message that we want to make sure that, that, w that we say time and again is to really find yourself in your art. And we appreciate you br bringing that conversation to us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys. Our pleasure. And Ken, as always, thanks for thanks for hanging with us and, and, and bringing some interesting conversation about what you're working on and how it applies as well. And Tracy, as always, thanks again for leading the conversation. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, and uh, everybody, we're glad that you're here week to week. We certainly enjoy bringing you these conversations. Um, it's, as, it's as enjoyable for us as, I'm, as I hope that it is for you as well. Again, thanks, everybody. Glad you were here. Um, and we'll see you again soon on Zeiss